Good morning. Okay, so we have Richard. Who else is in? I'm here, Adam. Adam. Andrew's here. Okay, Andrew. Joseph, Shay. We already have 525 people logged in and it's rising exponentially. Are they hearing you? No. Right now it's just us and we should not be using our video, correct? Correct. So nobody turn on your video. The participants okay. are all talking. Oh, they say they can hear us. They can hear us. They, they okay. should be muted. Okay. We should be muted. Melissa, let me know when to start. Okay, we will. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for logging in. We are still we still have people joining, so we will be starting shortly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will be beginning in a few moments.
Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Please welcome to the microphone Richard A. Berkowitz, founding and executive chairman of Berkowitz Pollock Brand Advisors and CPAs. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar to assist nonprofit organizations on how to apply for the payroll protection program loans enabled by the CARES Act and how to apply and to maximize the amount of the loan to be forgiven by the Small Business Administration. This morning, there have been several new developments which we want all of you to be aware of. Senator Rubio, in a webinar this morning, indicated that one of the primary qualification issues he wrote into this law, that it was only necessary for lenders to confirm receipt of information from borrowers. Lenders would not be responsible for verifying any information submitted by borrowers. The provisions in the law for falsifying any information are very, very strict. And that's what the government's relying on. The most important information that must be provided by the folks on this call is that you are an active 501c3 in operation on February 15, 2020 and that you pay payroll to individuals employed by your organization. We will go into further depth on these issues, which have been clarified and partially revised this last evening by the Small Business Administration when they issued their interim final rules. Those two terms are a little bit ambiguous, interim and final. But what I think the Small Business Administration is trying to tell us is these are the rules that we need to rely upon. However, they may change them as, as time goes on. So these 30, this 31 page uh, rule uh, memorandum came out last night and they, these new rules and revisions have been included in our remarks this morning and they do provide better clarity and direction for those of you on the phone who will be applying for the loans. Senator Rubio also said that while the loans are on a first come first serve basis, meaning you should apply quickly, he believes that Congress will most likely provide additional funds towards the end of April and that Congress will replenish the program in the event, runs, in the event funds run out. Berkowitz Pollock Brand is actively involved in the nonprofit community as volunteers and professionals. And we're happy to assist you in applying for these survival funds from the federal government through this seminar and helping you to anticipate what it will take to maximize the amount to be forgiven. Thanks to our co-sponsors, the Miami Foundation, Community Foundation of Broward, the United Way of Broward County, the United Way of Miami-Dade County, and the Jewish Federation of Broward County. Our firm supports all five organizations and I'm proud to be a former chair of the Community Foundation of Broward and proud to be the current chair of the Miami Foundation. Thank you all for the amazing work you do for our communities. You represent the best of our community and we're committed to helping you survive this economic crisis so that you all may continue to help those who are less fortunate. Please submit any questions you may have in the chat area of your screen about the CARES Act. We will answer your question during the last 15 minutes of this hour long webinar. We will also send you our presentation and our payroll protection program calculator to help you apply for the loan and calculate uh, the information necessary for forgiveness later on. We will also provide a recording of this presentation upon request. Andrew Leonard from our firm will now walk us through the information required. Andrew. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to speak to you this morning. As Richard mentioned, things changed overnight and this morning. So we're gonna talk about a lot of those details you may not have heard elsewhere that we think are extremely important uh, one piece of information before we go into the maximum loan, which is definitely going to be a very important factor. I'm only aware, of, as of this morning, of one bank that's currently accepting applications. 
all of the other banks, to my knowledge, are not ready yet. So I've already seen some questions coming in about how do we apply through certain banks. Most of the banks have not gotten their application process set up yet. As of last night, there was an expectation that none of the 12 major lenders were going to have it up today. But I did hear shortly ago that Bank of America now has their platform running. So if your banking relationship is with Bank of America, um, you will want to go ahead and start applying. Uh, our advice for everybody on the call is to apply as soon as you're able, but you wanna make sure you have accurate information. And that's our goal this morning is to help make sure that everyone has accurate information to properly calculate their loan, understand what forgiveness will look like. We're going to give you a tool, as Richard mentioned. We're gonna go through it shortly with you and show you how it works. And that should give you the information necessary to properly calculate and apply for the loan. So my, my first point here is what information are you going to need to apply? Uh, it is very important to provide that information, but as Richard stated, banks are not supposed to be spending a lot of time verifying. They're supposed to trust that you have provided the proper information to support and get the loans out as quickly as possible. That's the way this program was designed, and that's what the Senate and, and House of Representatives intended when they created these rules. The list of information that we expect banks to require is going to vary by bank. However, we've created a fairly comprehensive list that I'm about to go through with you that we believe should cover all of the items they'll be asking for. The first item that we believe should be collected is gonna be your 941s and your 940s as well as your W-2s and W-3s for your employees for last year. And the 941 would be also includable for this first quarter of 2020, um, as the calculation is going to require you to go back to the 12 previous months. As we're um, working, that, that means that your 941 that technically isn't due yet, you should probably get taken care of right away so that you can provide it as part of the package. Payroll reports for the 12 month period. This would probably be something out of your internal accounting system that would show gross wages and the other benefits that are gonna be includable. We're gonna go over that in a few minutes, what exactly is required to calculate. Um, and you're also gonna need documentation related to health insurance premiums paid by the company and anything related to retirement funding that's been done as an organization. Um, that would be matching uh, for 401ks if your organization has those matches, not the employee deferral. I think that's an important stipulation. This is not anything employee side. This is only things that would apply to the organization. Also, if you have family medical leave pay or vacation pay for the employees, you'll also want to include those. One big thing that has been miscommunicated by a lot of the banking organizations and is important to clarify is 1099 contractors are not includable for calculation of this loan. They made it very clear in the final interim uh, notice that came out last evening. They're, they're not going to be including anybody who gets a 1099. The reason behind that is because those people qualify to apply for their own loan and they don't want double dipping to occur with this money that's supposed to help stimulate and, and keep people paid. So what is included in payroll is the next question uh, or the next item. And this, this becomes extremely important. This is gonna be indica indicative of how you can get your maximum loan. So the items that are gonna be includable are gonna be wages, salary and or commissions paid to W-2 employees. Again, some people were interpreting the word commission to mean contract labor. That is not what is intended here. If your employee makes wage or salary or commission payments, that's what you're gonna include in the first of the seven items that are gonna be included in the calculation for payroll. Then cash tips or equivalents paid to those employees, vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave. Dismissal or separation pay, if you have a, a payment that was made while somebody was leaving. Healthcare benefits, including premiums paid by the company. So that would not include the employee side, as I mentioned a minute ago, but I think it's very important to pay close attention to that because employees often pay part of it. Retirement benefits, again, profit sharing matches would be what we'd be looking for there. 
and state and local tax assessed on compensation. This is gonna be, for most organizations, your reemployment tax that you pay to the state of Florida. This does not include FICA, Medicare, or federal or state withholding taxes that are done as part of the payroll. Those seven items need to be gathered. Then what we're gonna do is take that and calculate the maximum loan. The other clarification that we believe came out last night through the final interim notice is that the total of those numbers per employee for the annual 12 month period is going to stop at $100,000. Previously, it seemed as though they were only limiting the salary wage and commission to 100,000 and that other items would be in excess. We do not believe that is the case after the final interim notice came out yesterday. So if you have highly compensated people that are making in excess of 100,000, you need to cap them at 100,000 as part of that loan. Once you have those items calculated, again, we're gonna go through our calculator that we're gonna to provide to you. You're gonna multiply the outcome of that average over that 12 month period by 250% or times 2.5, and that will give you your maximum loan amount. They made clarification last night about the specifics of what document needs to be required in order to apply for the loan. There is an SBA official form available at sba.gov that is specifically gonna be required to use. It's a 2843 and that form needs to be filed. I'm sorry, it's a 2483. I'm sorry, a little dyslexia kicking in. I hope you don't mind. Uh, 2483 form is what you'll file with the SBA lender of your preference. Generally, that's going to that's going to be your bank. Not not don't randomly go out to Bank of America right now because I said they're taking applications. Nearly every bank we have spoken to has said they're not going to take on new clients for this loan. So you need to work with your existing lender in order to get approved for this loan. They don't have the bandwidth in order to help all of the people who need it unless they have existing relationships. Hopefully your, your, your lender takes care of you. If that for some reason becomes a problem, then obviously you'll wanna reach out to different lenders. You should be contacting your bank now, even if their, their application process is not up. If you haven't already, you want to put them on notice. You wanna to talk to your relationship manager and make sure that they understand that your intention is to apply for this loan. And you wanna to put together that information, the documents we discussed gathering and start working on your loan calculation as soon as possible. As I mentioned, the form 2483 is available on sba.gov. So you'll be able to access it and we can provide that along with the Excel spreadsheet that we're gonna be sending out to all of, your, all of you that are on this conference. Um, the last thing I wanna point out before I pass you on to my colleague Shay is there are limited funds for this. It's about $350 billion. A lot of people are estimating how long it's gonna to take to dole out those funds, but it's really uncertain because there's no confidence on exactly how much any of them are going to be uh, applying for, right? The maximum loan is $10 million. If you apply for $10 million, that means you have a $4 million monthly payroll. Um, there will be some companies who will qualify for that, but probably lots of small businesses will not. Um, so we wish you luck in that. And obviously you'll be able to give us feedback and request uh, information and help from us later. With that, I'm gonna pass it on to Shay Smith so he can give you some more details about calculating forgiveness and some other items we think are important. Hello, good morning, everyone. Nice to speak with you. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is rapidly changing and inclusive in what I'm gonna speak about. We've got some clarification uh, from the interim rule that came out last night from the SBA. So let's kind of start uh, with the basics and we're gonna, we're gonna roll through it. So in general, what is going on here? Well, you wanna get the loan forgiveness. I think that is clearly what makes this historic legislation. And they've, they've made it fairly easy to get forgiveness, but it's very specific. Uh, so we want, you know, our goal here is to prepare you and give you the tools that you need so you can have the maximum amount of the loan forgiven and track this as you go through. And Andrew mentioned there is a spreadsheet and one of my colleagues is going to explain that in more detail that you will have as a resource 
to help you calculate not just the loan amount that Andrew is speaking about, but also when you go back and in a sense, true this up and look at how much is going to be forgiven, you're gonna to wanna to use the same spreadsheet and we're create, you know, we've created this tool for you to use. So in general, if, if you, the SBA is gonna forgive the portion of the PPP loan proceeds that are used to cover the first eight weeks of payroll and certain other expenses. So that's the spirit of what they put out. And they, like I said, they further clarified that and we'll, we'll get into that. That's the spirit of it. So what specifically can you spend these dollars on and for what period of time? It's during the eight week period, beginning on the date of the origination of the PPP loan uh, for eight weeks are eligible to be forgiven. And these are payroll cost, mortgage interest in the ordinary course of business, payments for utilities, uh, rent on lease agreements. And then for borrowers with tipped employees, you can pay additional wages that way, which I'm not sure how much of that will apply to, to those dialing in here. So as Andrew mentioned, the same, as these definitions are changing a little bit around payroll, it's important to remember the same definitions apply here. So you're gonna use the same definitions to group your payroll expenses uh, and items that you can include there. Now, the amount of loan forgiveness will be reduced if there's an employee headcount reduction or a salary reduction in excess of 25% during the eight week period. So those are essentially two different calculations, one looking at headcount and one looking at the salary reduction and there is also this $100,000 limitation, okay, built in here. And there's another interesting piece that I'm gonna to get to it in, in a moment um, related to the new interpretations as well. So the actual amount of loan forgiveness will depend in part on the total amount of payroll costs, payments of interest, and so forth inc incurred before February 15th, 2020, uh, rent payments on leases dated before February 15, 2020, and utility payments under service agreements dated before February 15, 2020. So these items, this is from the updated information that came out last night, where they're kind of just specifying that you should have originated these agreements before February 15, 2020, okay, that you're including in your, in your cost. Um, now, something that that is very important that, that came out last night. Uh, some people were saying this and it wasn't entirely clear. They have determined that 75% is the pr appropriate percentage in light of the act's overarching focus on keeping workers paid and employed uh, in terms of the amount that can be forgiven that is payroll related, okay? So specifically, this limits non-payroll costs to 25% of the forgiveness amount and they feel that this aligns the elements of the program and ensures that the, the finite appropriations available under the PPP are directed towards payroll protection. Okay, so this is something that was clarified. So there's this other calculation now that's out there that 75% of the actual costs that are getting forgiven need to be payroll related. Now, there is an opportunity to, in essence, reverse any headcount or salary reductions prior to June 30th, 2020, and there's some things to be aware of there. Uh, and specifically, the way that it works is reductions in employment or wages that occur during the period beginning on February 15, 2020, and ending 30 days after enactment of the CARES Act shall not reduce the amount of loan forgiveness if, by June 30th, 2020, the borrower eliminates the reduction in employees or reduction in wages. So there's some technicalities in what I just said, but really what they're trying to get at here is they want you to hire employees back. So I think the main point to take from that is that if you did have to furlough employees, or if you do at some point, it's, it's worth considering if you can, in essence, bring back these employees and still have this, these dollars uh, forgiven. So that's, that's the spirit, okay? So how do you actually re request the loan forgiveness? How is the process actually going to work? I'm, I'm sure you guys are concerned about the nuts and bolts of this. What we suggest is working directly with your lender right away as soon as you originate the loan to have a strategy for how to accomplish this given everybody's gonna be 
busy and processing a lot of these loans and calculations, you want to have an understanding of how that's going to work. As Andrew mentioned, the applications for most banks are not even out yet. So this is really going to happen at eight weeks after you originate this loan, but it's something that does happen in coordination with your bank. And then obviously using the tools that we'll provide, you know, can, can be of some assistance as well and working with your CPA to the extent you need to. And then you, you verify that with your bank. Uh, your request will include documents that verify employee and pay data, as well as payments on eligible mortgages, leases, and utility obligations. And then you'll certify that documents are true and the use forgiveness amount to keep employees and make eligible mortgage interest and so forth. And then the lender must make a decision on the forgiveness within 60 days. So there's rules in there that, that this needs to be processed within a reasonable amount of time. Um, now, the terms for the PP loan, PPP loan amount not forgiven, this just changed overnight also, where it's now 1%. It was 0.5 going into last night, and now it's 1% on the clarifying uh, information that came out. Uh, there is no prepayment penalty though, so you can repay or have the loan forgiven earlier, and loan payments are deferred for six months. So I have gotten a lot of questions around the loan. The loan origination is a two-year loan. There's an origination date to the loan, okay? Payments are deferred for six months, and then the amount that is forgiven is truly interest-free. So all that interest goes away and the remaining interest, you know, amortized over that original two-year period. And like I said, the interest rate is 1%. So I know we went through a lot. We hope to clarify this with you and, and walk through some examples. Uh, Andrew mentioned it and as did I, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Joseph, and he is gonna go through, um, the spreadsheet that we built and show you a little bit about the application of the loan and then also the forgiveness part of it. Thank you very much. Joseph, I believe your microphone is muted. Okay, well, as to be expected right now, sometimes technical difficulties jump in. This is Andrew. I'm going to start going through the calculation spreadsheet. It seems like Joseph's having some trouble with his internet connection or some connectivity. So I'm going to go through the spreadsheet, give you some details. And again, we're gonna send the spreadsheet out to you. We think it's fairly clear, but we wanna make sure we talk through some of the details with you. As you can see on the screen, this is a screenshot of the Excel we've created. There's a box at the upper left-hand corner for you to put your borrower information in. So that would be the name of your organization and your EIN in those two boxes. Then you're gonna have a calculation spreadsheet that's going to have a line of months this, this line has been submitted in our Excel so that you can put in the date range you believe is appropriate for your institution. We believe that it should be March 2019 through February 2020, but some lenders are asking for a different range. Some are asking for the calendar. Year Hello, I just got back on if you could hear me. Joseph, go Andrew? ahead. I was walking yes. through, I just okay. went through the dates. So move on from the dates. And okay, very those. good. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I'm in, uh, uh, we're still learning how to work from home, but I'm very happy to be presenting this spreadsheet. I think it's going to be a um, great benefit to both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. The calculation is very simple. The harder part, as I'm seeing in the comments, is what is included, what is not included, which is what we've discussed. The calculation, we're going to be are to be used for the different source materials that one will be different. This calc this uh, first tab, this spreadsheet will
uh, pay for care, parental, family, sick leave, and this will all bring together to go through the, you know what, I, no one, I'm getting comments that I can't be heard. Yeah, Joseph, it sounds like your connection is bad. Uh, it might be best if Andrew picks up from here, um, just so we have some continuity in the audio. Yeah, so I I'm gonna go back in, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm sorry, obviously we're having a little bit of technology issues. Uh, ho hope you all understand, sometimes technology can be a challenge. So we, we were going through the spreadsheet. I talked about the time period that your bank lending institution is gonna require. Um, Point of clarification, I think we've got a lot of comments about how you don't have a lending relationship. You should, I would imagine, have at least a depository relationship. Those banks are the ones that you should be reaching out to if you don't currently have lending through a banking institution because they have a relationship with you. They should help you with this process. And we wanna make sure that everybody gets the help they need. So back to the spreadsheet. As we mentioned, the seven items that I talked through in my portion of the presentation, salaries, wages, commission, cash tips, vacation and other leave, dismissal and separation pay, healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, and state and local tax, that being the reemployment tax for most employers in Florida. There is a tab on our spreadsheet where you can put the details of each of those items in, and then this front page that you're seeing a screenshot of, you'll pull that information to this front page so that you can come up with the proper one month average and then apply the 250% multiplier or two times, two and a half times, um, so that you can get your proper loan amount. The process of gathering documentation that I spoke about a little while ago, that information is what you're gonna wanna include in the tabs behind this tab when you get that Excel spreadsheet. And you'll probably want to include this spreadsheet as part of your submission package if your bank has an electronic submission process, but some are going to have more of a PDF submission process. So each lending institution is gonna have a slightly different process, which is why it's important to go ahead and start talking to your banks, because you wanna make sure that what you do matches up well with your lending institution so that you can get this loan, right? We don't want anybody to have trouble getting the loan. That's the whole reason that we're having the conversation with you now. Once all of this pulls through, the, the program is set up, the Excel is set up to calculate that total, the average, multiply times 250% and give you the loan amount. All you need to do is populate the information in the other tabs and have it pull through to the grid at the top. The grid that starts at AA and goes down to the lower right hand corner. You do not need to fill in anything in the blue boxes or the lower green boxes. Those are calculated numbers. So you don't need to fill those out. The calculated numbers under AA, when you go to that tab, there'll be a total calculation when you put in the information. It will filter through and calculate there for you. We mentioned as well in Shay's section that there is a forgiveness calculator as part of the Excel that we've given you. That is at the end of the spreadsheet. There are many tabs to the spreadsheet. That calculator for forgiveness is going to require you to go back in at that uh, eight week time period and start entering in what you actually use the loan for, what your employee headcount was, is, and if you have re rehired people, how many people you've rehired, and it's gonna calculate what your expected forgiveness number is, so that when they come up with the forgiveness application forms, which are not available yet, when you get those application forms, you'll already have numeric information that needs to go in there, we expect them to require similar documentation to what we're asking you to gather in order to fill out and apply to go along with that application form. This Excel uh, should be readily used by everyone and it should be pretty straightforward. You shouldn't have too many problems with it. We're contemplating and we'll let everyone know on this call uh, in the future, but we're contemplating a second seminar to go through that forgiveness in a few weeks. We haven't made a final decision on that yet. Your feedback on whether or not that's something that you want uh, would be helpful to us. Obviously the forgiveness is at least eight weeks after you get your loan, not after you apply for your loan. So we probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of three months before you can apply for forgiveness. 
but we do want to make sure that we're a resource throughout the process, not just in the process of gathering the loan information and making your application. We'd like to be helpful. We believe in the community. We want to help you. And that's why we're doing the seminar and why we're going to make ourselves available to help with it going forward. I believe that's the best I can do with the calculation spreadsheet for today. We apologize again for Joseph having some connectivity issues. We're going to move along to Adam Cohen, who's going to share some other cash flow ideas that we think may help your organization during this time when cash is such a difficult issue. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Um, besides the loans that were made available by the CARES Act, there are other opportunities to consider when looking at your options for relief during this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the first is the deferral of payroll tax payments. This is available for wages paid through December 31st, 2020, and pertains to the 6.2% Social Security tax. Instead of your normal weekly, monthly, or quarterly remittance, your organization is now able to make payment in two equal installments. The first 50% of the tax would be due December 31st, 2020, and the second is due December 31st, 2021. Normal due dates apply for the 2021 payroll taxes. Next is the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA. This act provides employees of covered employers with options for up to three scenarios. The first is to receive up to 80 hours of sick leave at the employee's regular rate of pay if the employee is quarantined and is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, or two, up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay if unable to work because the employee is caring for someone who is quarantined or caring for a child whose school is closed. With this second option, there is also an opportunity for an additional 10 weeks of paid expanded family and medical leave at two thirds of the employee's regular rate if unable to work due to a bona fide need for child care. Covered employers are generally employers with fewer than 500 employees. Some provisions pertain to employers with fewer than 50 employees, so please consult your advisor. Eligible employees generally are all employees except for the 10 week provision, which only applies to those employed at least 30 days. Depending on the reason for the leave of absence, the limit on the calculation of pay is up to $511 per day to a max of $5,110 over the two week period or 10 days, 10 work days or $200 per day or 2000 over a two week period, depending on the option taken. There is also the employee retention credit. This is a fully refundable credit equal to 50% of qualified wages paid between March 12, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. The credit is 50% of a maximum of $10,000 of an employee's salary or $5,000. It is applied against the social security tax with the excess being refunded. Eligible employers include tax exempt organizations ordered to suspend operations or have experienced a more than 50% decline in gross revenue. Payroll includes health insurance premiums paid by the employer. Please note that the credit is not available for wages claimed under the Family First Corona Response Act, which, we, which was previously discussed, since the employer is already reimbursed for these costs. There are other considerations that can benefit the employee that should be noted. For one, the employee may withdraw up to $100,000 from their 403B between January 1, 2020 and December 31, 2020 without incurring the 10% early withdrawal penalty. They may also repay the distribution within three years without incurring the income tax. There may also be um, opportunities for favorable loans, but please cons consult your plan administration administrator because that may change from plan to plan. Lastly, there's an opportunity for organizations to approach consistent and heavy donors to explain the increased opportunities with charitable contribution donations in 2020. Individuals can now contribute cash to certain charities and receive up to a $300 above the line deduction. That means that they can claim the deduction whether they itemize or not. 
for individuals that do itemize, the 60% AGI limit for cash contributions has increased to 100% for 2020 with the excess contribution carried forward subject to the limitation in effect the year it is deducted. These cash contribution limits pertain to contributions to public charities other than donor advised funds and supporting organizations. The increase for corporations has been increased from 10% to 25% for 2020. One thing I wanna stress, which has been mentioned before in this presentation, is that this is a very dynamic situation. The details are constantly changing and Treasury was directed to release regulations within 15 days of the signing of the act, which would put it at April 11, 2020. But the regs are expected sooner. And uh, we, we have been going through and like Richard and, and others have explained already, we've had guidance as of last night and this morning and we're on top of it and available for questions. Thank you for your attention and let me hand you back to Richard Berkowitz. Thank you, uh, Adam, good job. And uh, we're gonna try to answer questions. We've got about 20 minutes and uh, we've received, I don't know how many chat questions, uh, literally hundreds of comments and another 111 questions. So we're trying to, uh, we're scrambling right now and trying to find the ones that are, are the, are the most uh, numerous and, and we'll try to address those. So it seems to be a lot of people uh, having questions about subcontractors. So there, there's, there's several issues with subcontractors. One is uh, when the 501c3 pays subcontractors, how is that dealt with under the law? And how are subcontractors themselves dealt with under the law? So Andrew, can you address that? Happy to address that, Richard. Subcontractors has been an area of contention among lending institutions and other advisors for the last week or so. However, we believe that the interim final notice that came out last night gives clarity that independent contractors 1099s are not eligible to be calculated into your payroll protection loan calculation. Those independent contractors qualify for their own loan using the same application form. They're also limited to the same $100,000 maximum limit on their annual compensation, which would be the 1099s they receive and any other income they make. They'll have to provide similar support, such as the 1099s they receive and other documentation showing their revenue, since they don't have a W-2 necessarily, in order to show that they have qualified for the um, loan amount that they're claiming. And again, they're going to be limited to that $100,000 that compensated employees are limited to as part of the calculation. I hope that clarifies the impact of independent contractors. Again, they will use the same application form. If you have an independent contractor, they are qualified to go and ask for this loan. They're limited to the same $100,000. But for purposes of your organization, you should not be including that independent contractor pay that you're paying out to those independent contractors. Thank you, Andrew. So the uh, uh, corollary question to that is, does the CARE Act only apply to organizations that run a payroll? So uh, again, sole proprietorships, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals are able to apply for the loan through this process. They're limited to the 100,000, but they're allowed to submit an application for themselves rather than submitting it for a company that pays payroll. Since there is no payroll if you're a sole proprietor or if you're self-employed or if you're an independent contractor in most cases, you're gonna use your revenue. And again, I think the support that they're gonna be looking for is the 1099s and other documentation you would typically provide when you're showing your revenue for other purposes, since there won't be payroll and W-2s and W-3s and 941s. I'm going to go to Shay. There have been several questions about whether payroll costs are greater than 75%. Will those be uh, forgiven? And also, if payroll costs are under 75%, what's going to happen? Shay, are you Sorry. muted? I'm, uh, can you hear now? I'm on. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Richard. So this is something that was 
discussed heavily prior to the interpretations that came out last night. Last night, I think it makes it pretty clear that the 75% uh, is a cap on, on, on payroll related expenses. Um, well, actually, I should say the 25% is the cap on non-payroll related expenses, really. So anything, anything above, uh, anything over the 25% will not be forgiven in, in terms of non-payroll related expenses. And once again, this definition goes back to the same, it's the same definition they used to qualify for the loan in terms of the items that are included. And so that is clear now that that's out there and it, there is a limitation of the 75% for payroll. Thank you, Shays. That's very clear. Appreciate that. And, and if that uh, amount, uh, if you don't, if you have greater than 25%, then you're going to have a balance at the end that's not forgiven. What happens with that? That's correct. So this does convert to what is now a 1% loan. And it's a, it's a two year term on the loan and lo loan payments are deferred for six months. So this is, those are the terms of the loan. It's an attractive loan at the end of the day. So your amount that was not forgiven as part of this process, after you go through the calculations converts to this loan. And as I mentioned previously, there is no prepayment penalty as well. So it is, it is really good affordable uh, financing. I mean, it's really some of the cheapest that we'll probably ever see. Uh, so that does convert to a 1% loan for the amount. However, uh, there were several provisions in the uh, interim final rules last night, which talked about if you misuse these funds, then uh, that, is, that is a criminal infraction. So the intent is that these funds be utilized for payroll and the, and the, uh, the non-payroll costs that are specified that we discussed. There are several questions about ownership, uh, and it's particularly uh, applicable to the group that's on the phone. 501c3s have no ownership. However, there are churches and uh, there are other entities where um, may not be specifically a 501c3 that have ownership rules uh, the first question is, how do you answer that question on the form which asks what your ownership is? And the second question is, what other issues relating to ownership need to be uh, dealt with in the, the loan application? Uh, I'll open this to anybody that wants to answer that. Okay, it looks like that's coming to me. This is Andrew again. Um, <laughs> so the 501c3 and uh, other institutions, if you don't have an owner, which most of you are not going to have an owner as a not-for-profit, you're, you're gonna to have to fill out the application form without owner information. There is no owner, so it's not reasonable for the bank to expect you to have an owner. But this is one of those areas where you need to make sure you're communicating with your client or with your bank and talking to them about their process. Making sure that application fits what they need it to fit is really the most important thing because they're ultimately the ones that are going to get you approved and get you the funds that you're looking for. So it needs to be an open dialogue. You need to be communicating with the banker that you have a relationship with to make sure that this goes well for you. But if there is no owner, you, you should not be expected to have owner information. And I don't see any way that the charitable organizations we're talking to, including religious institutions, would have an owner. So I don't believe you have an issue there. Fill out the application to the best of your knowledge and keep an open dialogue with your bankers. Um, the uh, couple, uh, and, oh geez, I went to a different email. Um, what, uh, Andrew, what, a couple questions on the qualifying amounts for payroll. One is uh, pensions, which I think you mentioned, but if you could elaborate on that. And uh, the second is FICA and withholding taxes, what the impact of those are. Um, and that's it, go ahead. Okay, ha happy to talk about that. So I mentioned pensions in my 
what is going to be included in the calculation to maximize. I'll also it. add to that uh, calculating vacation and sick leave. Okay. So vacation and sick, let's start with that one actually. Vacation and sick leave is going to be based off of how you pay your employees. So normally in a payroll summary that would come out of whatever system you're tracking your payroll in is going to include their standard wage or salary and then separate line items for vacation and or um, sick leave. Those items need to be specifically separated for purposes of this calculation in order to make sure you get to that proper number for your loan calculation. So you should, in your payroll system, be tracking that. That should be part of it. On the pension payments, remember it's only employer contribution for those pensions. And that's going to be a match in most cases. Um, since you are not-for-profit organizations that we're here speaking with, I wouldn't expect you to have something similar to a profit sharing, but you may have a match as an organization. That would be the piece of the pension that you're allowed to use for part of the calculation. Great. Um, and there's also a question about bonuses. If bonuses is included in your payroll, it would be, of course, included in the calculation. Yep. Bonus is going to be included under that triple or that double A, the double cap A, wages, salary, and other similar compensations where you should include the bonus calculation. That's going to be part of their potential uh, monthly that's going to be multiplied by two and a half times. Adam, do you, are you aware of uh, any of these rules applying to 501c6s? The only thing that I've seen so far is it applies to 501c3s and 50319s, which are veteran organizations. I don't believe Not it anything. No, I don't believe it applies to 501c6s. Uh, is there any, has anybody seen any detail on what's in the utility costs? Yeah, utility costs is specifically detailed in the act. It lists most major utilities. I'm pulling up the act right now so I can read the list aloud. But it, it's basically okay, it's basically going to be the general utilities. I have it up on my screen. I just got to get to the right section. Uh, but it's going to be electricity. Um, gosh, I'm how about, trying to get... uh, how about Why don't we go on to the next come... question and we'll come back okay, to this I'll one. Give me a minute to, to find okay. it, Richard. How about workers' comp, anybody? Is that included? Any comments? Okay. I'll keep going. Workers' compensation is not included. It is not one of the costs that you can use to calculate the loan, nor is it a cost that you can use to apply for forgiveness. Um, if a nonprofit is a startup, uh, can we apply for this loan? They had to be in existence by February 15th. I believe that's the case. It said the, the organizations had to organizations have to be in existence February 15th. And if you have payroll between in that after that period of time, you can use that payroll to calculate your loan. Um, I believe that's correct, Richard. The answer is leave the ownership line blank. Do not put anything on it if you're 501c3. Um, yes, 501c uh, qualifies. You can apply for a loan with employees working from home. Uh, profit companies may apply for these loans. Uh, we have a seminar actually this afternoon starting at 2.30. Uh, if anybody wants to be included in that, that seminar, uh, it's another hour seminar applying to for-profit organizations. Send us an email and we'll be glad to um, register you. Um, would you please be so kind to expand on employee retention credit when revenue stream is affected? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, uh, I'd like to just jump in for one second, Richard, the covered utility yep. payment. I want to make sure I clarify for everyone. So the list from the act of utilities that are going to qualify are electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet access for services in that period. So, it covers most major utilities. And remember, utilities is one of the qualified expenses for forgiveness that you're gonna be allowed to use for forgiveness. I also saw one question I don't think we've covered yet that I think is important, but I've seen multiple people ask, which is do salaries, if they're above 75%, help us make sure that the forgiveness qualifies? I believe that one of the best ways 
to get full forgiveness on the loan is if you can use all of it on salaries. One recommendation that I've been making to organizations, mostly for profits that I've been speaking to, but I believe it'll apply to all of your organizations, is you should have a separate account, a bank account created, drop your loan funds in there and use it for permissible expenses. When it comes time to get forgiveness on these loans, you want to have the most transparent picture you can have so that you get the forgiveness very plainly chosen for you and they don't have to go in and figure out a lot more details. Um, question, the loan does not require collateral. Uh, if you had another SBA loan that you uh, applied for in the last several weeks, those loans uh, will in effect be added uh, there are diff actually different loans that will have different treatment, but they are they are all uh, affect they all affect the loan amount here. Uh, we'll be covering that this afternoon if you'd like to be in that, but it's a little bit more de too detailed to go over at this point. Andrew, you want to provide any further explanation? Uh, not not on that, Richard. But I did I did get a bunch of questions when I was going through the utilities. They're asking me to go through the list again, so I'm going to read it a little okay. more slowly to make sure everybody gets it. Utilities are going to include payments for electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, and internet access for your business or your organization in this case, not business. Um, I also see one more comment where you're saying that I, I did not mention FICA, Social Security and Medicare when I was discussing what was gonna be includable. FICA and Medicare are specifically excluded costs. They do not go into your loan calculation, nor do they go into your forgiveness calculation. So please be careful when you're doing the calculation. Those items, FICA, does not apply. It's specifically excluded by the act. Uh, there's a question about where the rules are. We will provide the interim and final rules when we send out our deck and our calculator and our recording. So if you, uh, you'll be able to look at those rules. They, they are, those rules are contained in there, but if you wanna get the detail that Andrew was just talking about, I don't believe that detail is in the rules. It's no, that, that, the, that, that's, that's correct. The that's in the CARES Act. You're gonna to have to go to section 1106 of the act if you wanna see the rules on what utility payments qualify. Um, Okay, so uh, it is, um, well, actually we can do a couple more questions here. So. Richard, I don't, I don't know how common it is. I saw one question pop up for somebody that had 1800 employees. And go ahead. I'm not gonna get too much into it. I happen to see something on it though. Businesses with 500 to 10,000 employees are not eligible under the PPP, uh, such entities can apply under uh, directly under Title IV of the CARES Act, and these loans do not provide forgiveness, but they allow deferment of principal and interest uh, for the first six months. So that's something they can get more information on. That is a separate provision of the CARES Act. And those loans, I believe, are two percent, if I recall. That's correct. Okay, so uh, we will. Uh, we thank you all for being on this call. We will have a hotline open at 3.30 this afternoon. The hotline number is now, on, it should be on your screen. Um, we will be answering questions uh, this afternoon and over the weekend for those of you who are anxious to apply for these loans. There are a lot of questions about banks. These loans uh, are, are pretty difficult for the banks uh, in, in the sense that there's going to be an enormous number of loan applications that are made in a very short period of time. So the banks uh, are trying to set up their electronic applications to provide for that. As mentioned early, Bank of America set up theirs. But the, the best thing for you to do is call your bank that you have a banking relationship right now where you pay your checks out of and let them know, you know, find out from them what their process is gonna be if you can get somebody on the phone. Uh, and uh, either that or wait for them to 
get live on their uh, on their website so that you can start loading this information. I have one last comment, Richard, before we adjourn. I saw questions about what email address you would use to get invited to the for-profit presentation we're doing this afternoon. I included marketing at BPBCPA in the chat comments. So you can go and get that email address. I know it might be hard to write it down while you're listening to me, but I did put it in the chat. So if you want to um, ask for access to that, you can email marketing at BPBCPA so that we can have you come and listen to our for-profit presentation. We appreciate the opportunity to help all of you, and we very much look forward to your continued service to the community and making our world a better place. And thank you all. Uh, thanks to Melissa and Hannah and our marketing department for pulling this together in three days. Appreciate an amazing effort and some long nights. And also uh, to the community foundations of uh, Miami and Broward County and the United Ways of Broward and Miami-Dade and uh, the Jewish Federation of Broward County for being, uh, uh, for their confidence in affiliating with us on this presentation. Thank you, have a great day and stay safe everybody.